can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal with lies. Hey everybody. So, something a little different for you today, but before I get into it, I wanted to start off by thanking one of my subscribers and patrons, Milady Clark, uh, for sending a wonderful care package along, including this gorgeous flask, um, this uh, grinder, same image actually, it's a nice thing, and what I'm looking forward to most of all, a uh, copy of The Idiot by Dostoevsky. So I've been catching up on a lot more reading lately, I've got a lot more free time. So, with all of this being the case, and thank you again, Milady Clark, for these wonderful gifts, I want to start out by telling something of a story to try and introduce us to the topic at hand. Now, this was back when I was young, about maybe six, seven years old. And I'd recently moved to a town called Londonderry in New Hampshire. It was our first time moving here, and um, found myself... Spending a lot of time hanging with the neighborhood kids. Didn't really like all of them, but I got along well enough. Neighborhood kids being neighborhood kids in that time of the 80s and 90s, well, things went as they did. Now, there are three of them in particular who I hung out with. It was Steve, Shane, and Joey. Now, Steve was a bit of a wild child, always getting into trouble, starting fights, breaking things... All manner of madness come out of that kid. He was quite a handful for his parents and the neighborhood at large, but he was a good guy. We were pretty good friends for a good long while. Shane was something of a... Uh, he was tough to get a read on, to be honest with you. He was one of those types of things where one day he's one of your best friends and you're out playing Ghostbusters or Ninja Turtles, and then the next day, oh, well, he's got a new set of people to run with, so it's time to make fun of the nerdy kid. Now, between those two, those were still my friends. But then there was Joey. And Joey was the rich kid. The bigger house, had all, most, had all the toys, his parents drove the nicest cars. And he had an attitude which you might expect would follow this kind of thing. In my youth, I really wasn't a big fan of people. Didn't get along with other kids too well, didn't really care for adults. I found, more or less, I actually preferred animals to people. For one thing, they didn't talk. For another thing, they didn't judge you. And for one more thing, I suppose, just observing them in their natural habitat was so much more interesting to me than seeing the legions of uh, future wastoids just sort of shuffling through the school or out in the recess yard. Now, as part of this, there was a lot of uh, animals in my area. Just behind our house was a long tract of woods, this forest that ran along a ridge line at the sort of graceful slope that the neighborhood existed on. And it led for miles if you went the right direction, ultimately leading up to a larger nature reserve. And I used to love going for long walks out in there and just getting lost until the sun went down. It was one summer, though, that I found a number of odd items in my backwoods. There were traps, animal traps. Some were the habahearts, which is just a cage. Others were actual snares and the like. I didn't take long until I found out that this was Joey's doing. And I started out by tripping all of the traps in my own yard. Now, when this got around to my other friends, something rather interesting happened one day. And they showed up on my front door, Shane and Steve, saying that they'd found more traps in the backwoods behind Joey's house next door to mine, and that we were all going to go set them off together. I was totally down for this, so sneaking through the woods, the three of us made our way to those back, for that back patch of forest behind Joey's house there, and uh, found a series of traps there, but it was odd because I noticed after a moment that it was only Shane who was with me. Steve had dropped off somewhere. I didn't know where he'd gone. And then it was at that moment, just as we came upon the traps, that Shane put me into something of an arm bar, just a half-Nelson kind of thing. And Steve and Joey and came out from behind Joey's pool, armed with golf clubs. And I got a bit of a beating that day. I was sent home with some bumps and bruises, and the kids laughed at me as I walked away. But when I got home, I found it wasn't even actually the beating which hurt. It was the sensation that the trust I had in my friends could be so easily thrown away. The people would actually side up against me 
just to be on somebody else's side. What I learned that day was about the nature of betrayal. And for a six-year-old, it's quite a lesson, but it's one that stuck with me. Now, over the course of my life going forward, just like the rest of us, I've got plenty of other opportunities to experience the sting of betrayal and the breaking of trust. Some just sort of recently happened, which got me really thinking a lot more about the topic itself, trust and betrayal. It's an interesting thing because betrayal itself was usually predicated on the exposing of a given truth, which was hidden by a lie beforehand. Now, it's sometimes intentional, and sometimes it's accidental, but it happens. And it always ends up being some odd mix of truth and deceit that sort of ultimately stirs the pot enough to where it can happen. But in thinking on this, I came to realize that when it comes to trust issues themselves and the concepts of betrayals and deceptions, it's not as one-sided as we oftentimes think. Oftentimes, when we're confronted with a situation in which somebody who perhaps was very close to us proves to be something entirely different than we'd come to know them to be, it can be easy to sort of point fingers and accuse them of simply being duplicitous and manipulative the whole way, which to a certain extent is bound to be true. But it's a little more difficult to actually accept and understand the roles we play in deceiving ourselves when it comes to other people. No one... I believe, really, genuinely, truly, and fully knows anyone else. This is largely because very few, if any, people probably genuinely have a solid enough beat on who they are as people to really be able to affect any sorts of airs of, you know, sort of genuine being towards other people. And it's by no fault of their own. We all do it. We all have our delusions about who we are and what our place in the world is. Some of them are puffed up with bravado, a sense of uh, confidence, which can sometimes border on arrogance, which itself can either be genuine arrogant confidence or an attempt to mask deeper insecurities. Other people likewise, too, will go in an opposite direction, sometimes viewing themselves as loathsome pieces of shit, even though there may be nothing in their history or past or lifetime which would really warrant them feeling that way. But we have understandings of ourselves which range from the quietly and painfully true to the obviously but necessarily deceitful. We lie to ourselves about who we are, we lie to others about who we are, and in turn those same people do the same to us. Now there are genuine betrayals to be experienced. There are times in which people actively make a choice to sacrifice a friendship or a bond with another person in pursuit of something that, for whatever reason, they perhaps feel is more important or more necessary in their lives. But when the sting of that betrayal comes through, two important things to keep in mind as you slog through it and make your way out to the other end. The two things to keep in mind are this. One is that you were not solely betrayed by that other person. Your acceptance of what they presented you with was the first to see. The second one was whatever framework or construct you came up with for yourself as to who that person actually was. It's the sort of that classic, uh, sort of that classic parable, I'm a fucking snake, you dumb bitch. Well, some people are just snakes, and we will go to great lengths in our own mind to try and convince ourselves otherwise. But the other thing to keep in mind and the other thing to consider and ponder is the nature of trust in a broader sense. We live in a rather paranoid age these days. Now, granted, it's not to say that people always universally trusted each other better in the past. However, these days, between the passive-aggressive forms of communication that so many of us seem to cling to via social media and the like, as well as just the general fact that betrayals and lies are such a regular part of so many people's lives that when one gets involved with another person, especially if they've been burned recently, it can be very, very difficult to actually find any actual trust with that person to begin with. Even sometimes the most obvious statements about themselves come into doubt in your mind as you sort of swim through your own perhaps bitterness and distrust. This leads a lot of people to approach life and society with a, a sort of blanket defensive guard up at all times, never letting anyone in, never trusting anyone else. And it's a defensive mechanism which, for those of us who've been through serious betrayals and such, makes perfect sense. Why would you expose yourself like that again when the odds are good that it's just going to burn you in the end? 
This is a safe and sensible defensive mechanism. However, it is one that I've found on my own part, and I've found with a lot of other people, and I'm starting to believe perhaps in society as a, in general, as maybe taken too far. This notion that you can only ever rely on number one, that you are your only true friend, and that nobody else will ever really be able to to reach that soft, gooey core inside of yours again, because you're not going through that again. These instincts are as protective as they are destructive. Because quite often they end up setting us up for the next betrayals on their own without us even being aware of it. I think in this, like with most things, the wisest path a person could take would be to find some calm and rational middle ground. To be sure, it would be foolish to simply give everyone you meet the full benefit of the doubt and run whatever risks come along with that willy-nilly simply on principle of being a trusting and kind person. Likewise, though, shutting everyone out, building walls around yourself so that you can protect yourself against the inevitable future heartbreaks and betrayals that you're sure that this rotten society in which we live is bound to throw at you at a certain point will ultimately do nothing except keep, except keep people further away than perhaps they need or ought to be. It'll keep you from enjoying and experiencing the fulfilling nature of true bonds with other human beings. And likewise, as you continue deceiving yourself, convinced that this is the only way you can exist, and that the only intelligent thing you can do is to keep everyone out at arm's length and everyone away, well, eventually, at a certain point, someone will find a crack in that armor, a crack in that wall, a chink in the armor, if it was. And when they do, this individual who feels so safe and secure in their senses of self, in their seemingly shrewd decision not to trust others, this person will find themselves even more vulnerable than they were before. This isn't just because somebody's found a way to get past their defenses, but because once they have the sensation of trust and kinship with this other individual, regardless if it's bona fide and true or not, will likely appear very much to be like a stake to a starving man. Because the human being needs that connection with others. And once they get a taste, especially if it's been denied, the vulnerability they open themselves up to becomes even greater. We, by and large, seem to have lost a great deal of our abilities to really communicate and understand one another in, I'd say, at least healthy ways. And as in previous videos, I discussed that social media itself has largely cheapened our communications and relations with one another. And going forward, I actually do plan to explore more aspects of how our modern culture is affecting our psyches and our relationships to each other. How it is that these communication breakdowns between us not only affect people on personal levels, but also expand outward, reaching into the realms of the political and the philosophical and the social. The ways in which we comport ourselves and carry ourselves when it comes to our relations to others oftentimes does color in a great deal of how our political perceptions ultimately work. Those with more self-centered or near solipsistic philosophies that would state that you always got to look out for number one, well, it's probably a pretty safe bet that to a fair extent a great deal of that can be seen reflected in their interactions with other people. It's going to take a lot of work, a lot of thought, and a lot of very careful balancing between our differing and competing natures until we can really, I believe, get any kind of a firm grip on exactly what this all means. Betrayal and, 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 and the, the breaking of bonds and the breaking of trust, these are, just, these are naturally occurring parts of the human experience, and in many ways they're necessary as they themselves carry with them a great many lessons that we need to learn. But in accepting the lessons from the experiences that we're given, it's important to remember not to let our emotions begin making our decisions for us. For once we do that, whatever problems we're seeking to escape will likely, if not inevitably, end up getting worse at some point down the road. And then everyone will basically just be waiting for one explosive catalyst moment in which they can have some short-lived epiphany before being battered back into whatever box they just climbed out of. 
So, as always, I appreciate your patience. And with this new month now getting underway and uh, good old fucktober uh, well and over, there will be actually more videos coming to this channel, of course, as well as live streams. Later on next week, I will actually be streaming with a former union colleague of mine who was involved in the Fight for 15 campaign in Chicago. This coming amidst revelations that the leadership of that campaign was apparently rife with sexual assault, abuse, and uh, other sorts of nasty behaviors. It's going to be a fun thing to find out what the union world was like after I left. I'll be announcing the actual date of that stream sometime either over the weekend or early next week. But in addition to that, you can look forward to more videos on a more consistent and regular basis. I'm going to be shooting for three a week. Uploads on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. This will be uh, in addition to the YouTube Saints, which takes place Sunday nights at 10.30 Eastern every Sunday night on the YouTube Saints channel. And the Midweek Show, which I'll be hosting shortly after putting this video up over on our Twitch channel. So all that being the case, I thank you all for your support. Relevant links are down below. Feel free to like, comment. If you're not subscribed, give a subscribe now. Share the video around, and if, you consider, and if you'd like to, consider becoming a patron, or at least supporter of the channel, either using the Patreon link below or any of the other alternatives I've posted. And once more, too, if you'd be interested in sending me some fun little care package like the Dear Milady Clark did, the P.O. Box will also be listed in the description. I thank you once again for your time and for sticking around, and I look forward to exploring more shit other than just the banalities of pop politics with you going forward. But again, don't worry. There'll be that, too. I suppose that being the case, you're dismissed. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster, and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves, to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop, and build them up with worn-out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose and start again your beginnings, and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they're gone, and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on.